Father, thank you again for giving us your word in, in English, in our own language, that we can read it, that we can learn about who you are, and, and more than that, that that your word would transform us. We pray today that you would give us clarity of mind and so that we can see who you are and how you've acted in history uh, and then open up our, our hearts as well to, to love and to treasure you and to be amazed at what you've done. Um, please change us as w you reshape our heart and our mind uh, and may it all be so that you would be honored, so that you would be glorified and that we would have deep and lasting joy forever in you. We thank you and we praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so Numbers and Deuteronomy is what we're going to look at today. Um, again, we're, we're going to try to, I'll kind of try to give you big picture overviews to be of things to be thinking about and looking for, and then maybe uh, bring out a few passages that are just important. Um, and, and yeah, so we'll go from there. But so far, let me give a little bit of a run-up to these books. So far, we've been looking at the first five books of the Old Testament. Sometimes you'll hear it called the Pentateuch as, as this one unit that Moses purposefully composed to communicate the core kind of beginnings of what God is doing in the world with his people. And we looked at Genesis with um, creation and then the fall into sin and the way that God is undoing the curses that come with the fall and his promises to bring a king who will restore creation and fix really everything that is wrong. And then with Exodus, we saw how God revealed himself as a saving, rescuing God who fights for his people. We saw that how that kind of fleshed out in life. And then he brings them, kind of the whole Old Testament is working towards Sinai. And Sinai and the revelation of God on Sinai is the, the beginning foretaste of the return to Eden that we've been talking about, that God's going to, to fix and reestablish close relationship with his people and spread his glory across the face of the earth, which was Adam's original job. And Sinai is sort of this pinnacle moment in the Old Testament that everything flows toward and then flows out of. And so when we wrapped up last time we were together two weeks ago, we ended looking at Leviticus, which is sort of the center of the first five books. And if you remember, the Day of Atonement is actually the center of that book as well. So there's this kind of theology being fleshed out by Moses, even in how he organizes the structure of the Old Testament itself. And so we're looking ahead, we're looking at how God is going to, to make things right and to fix them. And we see at the end of Exodus, Moses can't enter the tent of meeting. God's glory comes down, it looks like everything's on the right track, but then not even Moses can go in. Leviticus fleshes out how, how that holy God and unholy people can actually come together. And we get the whole kind of sacrificial system that we laid out. Then as we move into numbers, what we're going to see is sort of the first 10 chapters, they're still at Sinai, but then we're going to start to sort of um, come down off the, you know, the other side. It, it kind of works because it's Sinai's a mountain. So like you have this mountain in the middle and you come down off the, the other side and starting in chapter 10 of Numbers, they're going to start moving towards the promised land. So you start to get movement again in the narrative. And, but it, Numbers is sort of a sad book. Numbers, the word that we're going to use here is refining. Some other words that I threw around were, were unbelief or the, the Hebrew name of the book is in the wilderness. That's this the the word that's the header of the Hebrew uh, book. And so this is the in the wilderness section. And in this section, what you basically see is two generations of Israelites. There's a census or a counting of the people in chapter one, and then again in chapter 26. And what the, that structure is going to do is show you an unbelieving generation who, as you'll see as we get into it, they, they don't believe. And it centers really around belief, which is important because everyone thinks, oh, well, in the Old Testament, you just had to keep all the laws. No, it was about belief and faith from the very beginning. And Numbers is going to bring out, you have an unbelieving generation, and then God's going to purify and refine and start to show how he can take unholy people and make them holy. And the second generation, they're going to be very uh, zealous is probably the best word. They're going to care about what God cares about. And ultimately, they're going to believe. Uh, at least, at least some of them. So the word is refining. And then the sentence would be, how does God refine a rebellious people and make them holy? Now we have these themes that I've listed out. They're kind of the main themes that run through the whole Old Testament. And so each book, I want to just trace 
where are we with each of these themes and how are they going to, um, how are they playing out? So if you remember, land is important because Adam and Eve are driven away from the land where they could experience relationship with God. And in the Abrahamic promise, the reason he's promised land is because there's going to be a kind of mission control center from which the people can, can be close with God and then launch the mission out into the world to, to cause God's glory to fill the earth, which was Adam's original mission. So with that land promise, this entire book is kind of a working out of this thing that happens with Moses all the way back in Exodus 33. If you remember, he comes down from the mountain, and what does he find the people doing? Way back in, in Exodus. They're worshiping what? The golden calf, yes. So they're, they're worshiping this golden calf, and, and essentially when Moses prays to God to forgive them, God has this moment in chapter 33 where he says, hey, you guys can go up to the land, I just won't go with you. And I heard someone say this week, it was really convicting, he's like, I think most evangelicals would take that deal. Like, we'll take all the blessings and the good stuff. It's okay if you're not with us. But Moses doesn't take that deal. And so number starts working out, okay, well, how are we going to get these people into the land with God? And there's a refining that needs to happen. So that's what, X, or, um, that's what numbers is kind of working through. Also note and remember, the land isn't the final goal. The land is always presented as a place from which the nations can look and see, oh, that's what Yahweh is like. And it says that the nations should, this doesn't actually happen until, really until Jesus, but the nations should look and, and, and be drawn to Yahweh through the way that Israel lives. And then from there, that's when his, his glory is going to cover over the earth as the nations begin to be converted. The goal's always, missions is always in the goal from the very beginning. So we're, we're not thinking of the land as the final ultimate goal, but it's sort of this Eden 2.0 that's going to then be a, a launching pad for relationship and mission. Okay, also, if you remember this idea of, of uh, Eden was the original place where man dwelt with God, and then the tabernacle and the temple continue this. So numbers, what it's going to hit and that you need to keep an eye out for, or I guess if you just read it with the church plan, what you can remember, is um, how unbelief and belief that's the core thing that separates relationship with God. It's not, you know, did you, did you move into a neighbor's landmark stone or not? That's, as we would say it nowadays, that's kind of the, the fruit that comes from belief. But the, the root, the, the thing that is core is belief and unbelief. And Numbers is going to bring that out of time. Also, little less uh, popular, but true. Numbers reminds us that God's presence is the thing that we most need. It is what satisfies our souls the most. But as, as fallen humans, it's inherently dangerous to us because of sin, because of death. And so something needs to happen. Someone needs to stand in for us. We saw this in Leviticus and a lot of other places, but Numbers brings this out as well. Okay, uh, third thing to keep an eye out for in Numbers. The, the whole theme of royal priesthood, what Adam was supposed to be, is, is sort of transferred to Israel at Sinai, that they're going to be a kingdom of priests representing God to the world. But here's what numbers, do you remember I mentioned that you have really similar stuff happening in, right, leading up to Sinai and then after Sinai? I think I have uh, the, yeah, if you turn one page over, uh, we can mention this again, but there, there's this, this, perfect mirroring before and after Sinai. And we talked last week or two weeks ago about how that mirroring seems to indicate that what happens at Sinai, it's obviously the law is good and kind, but it makes things worse for Israel. They get judged more harshly for things that happened before. They, they have, it, it just, it, what it does, and what I think it's trying to bring out for you, is the inability, this is the way Paul says it in the New Testament, the inability of the law to save or, or to change the heart. The law holds up a picture of what righteousness is. It holds up a picture of God's holiness and goodness and wisdom. But when that mirror gets held up to, to us humans, it, it only points towards, oh, we deserve 
to be away from this God. We, we don't, we um, fall short of the glory of God. And so Numbers starts to show, okay, the law, far from, from changing the people, actually just reveals what righteousness is and doesn't change their heart. And it's going to come out in Numbers and Deuteronomy. Um, so we're still looking for someone who can, Israel can't fulfill this role to be a kingdom of priests. They need a new heart. And so we need someone to come who can give a new heart to his people and, and who in, in theory has a new heart himself or doesn't need one. All right. Um, this idea of a royal seed coming or a king coming uh, who can crush the serpent and then kind of the war between the children of Satan and the children of Yahweh. This comes out in a really interesting way. So you'll see, um, I was struck as I read through it this time. I, I really hadn't p tied this together before. But um, over and over again, Moses brings up the, the Anakim, the Rephaim, and the Nephilim. And all these, these uh, groups of people that seem to be tied all the way back to Genesis 6 and some demonic activity that's going on there. And it seems like what Moses is trying to bring out here is that the, the conquest and the war that goes on there really is this continuation of the followers of Yahweh and the followers of Satan. Or if you remember from uh, a while ago, the, the city that God is going to rebuild of, of bringing them back to Eden versus man's attempt at Babel to get safety, security, peace, joy, his own way. And so those kind of continue. Every time you see uh, those references to Anakim, Rephim, Nephilim, exceptionally tall people, it, this comes up all the time, both in Numbers and in Deuteronomy. Um, in the land. That's a whole separate thing that could be interesting to talk about, but we'll keep going. Um, and then uh, we'll hit this, but Balaam's prophecy at the end is going to talk specifically about this seed, this king that's coming, and uh, it, it's just a really cool, I'd like to, if we can, walk through uh, that portion. Okay. Let's do this. Let's, let's move forward. Um, the section on blessing and God fighting for us in covenant and faith. I've said most of those things already. So I'd like to move forward. Um, structure of the book, I already mentioned a little bit. We've got a, a first and second generation. Within that first generation, there's kind of, uh, we could say two sections. You've got while they're at Mount Sinai, first 10 chapters, and then they go into the wilderness toward the promised land, verse, or, uh, chapters 10 through 19. Then 20 through 25 is the beginning of this transition period where you start to see, okay, this refining is happening and the old generation in their unbelief is, is essentially getting killed off and the new generation is starting to rise up. It's gonna pinnacle. Do you remember the story of Phineas? Does that name mean anything? Okay, uh, you have a dog named Phineas. Yeah. After the story? Okay, we'll try to get there today. Um, so the, that's a, that is essentially the pinnacle of the book because it's, it's the death of the final, it's the final death mentioned of the old generation pitted against the zeal of the new generation. So we'll, we'll get there, but that's a uh, kind of transition point. And then the final chapters of the book really illustrate how much this new generation cares about the land, but they're not even in it. But the point is they believe and trust the Lord that he's gonna fulfill the promise. And so they care about what God cares about, even though they're not actually there yet. So, um, I tried to put a map, but unless you have the best eyes in the world, it, it just didn't work out. Um, if I email this week, I'll try to maybe get a little bit better one. Um, okay, so chapters one through four. So the, the first 10 chapters, they're still at Sinai. And what you have at the beginning is a military census. And it really is a, a military emphasis. And what you're going to see throughout this book and the conquest is that the the fighting in the military aspect, the emphasis on it is that two things. One, God fights for them, not them. And two, godliness and purity is what matters, not military strength. And so we'll get into this more in Joshua, but just kind of keep those in mind. And, and also, once as you're reading the um, this first section of numbers, it's easy to sort of gloss over like, like oh, and this, this amount, and this thousands, and this tribe. This is fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. You're going to be a great and mighty nation. We started with one guy that balloons to one family, that's 70 people that go into Egypt, and then you keep getting these lines of, and they multiply and increase greatly. Well, now, now they're, they're around 600,000 listed here. So you see the multiplication already happening, the fulfillment of this promise already starting, and you also get 
in chapter four, which this will, um, this will come up later, but the Levites are given as uh, basically assistants and guards to the priests. So all the way back to the golden calf incident again, Moses comes down the mountain, sees the people basically going crazy worshiping this calf. There's, there's, um, there are implications in that passage about what they're doing that are bad implications. Uh, he calls and says, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. One tribe comes, and it's the Levites. And after they've gone through the camp and, and killed those who will not trust in the Lord, he says, you're ordained for service today. Well, this is the counterpart to that where he's saying, okay, now I'm going to give you Levites to Aaron's family and you will be like the guards around the temple and the carriers of the stuff of the, of the, um, of the tabernacle. And so they kind of have this honored position where they are to basically guard the uh, people from what happened with Nadab and Abihu, to keep unclean things from coming into the temple and defiling it and really damaging the, the people who would break the law. So the family of Gershom, cover, uh, they carry all the soft coverings, basically. The family of Merari covers, carries all the frames and the posts, like the infrastructure of the tabernacle. And then the one you just want to keep in mind, the family of Kohath, they carry the furniture, which is like the most honorable stuff. So they're kind of the highest among the Levites and the closest to the family of Aaron, the priests. Just want to keep that in mind. Um, Chapter five and six, we start getting these laws about purity and about how, okay, so the people are arranged around the camp such that they're all facing in toward the tabernacle in the middle. Then you get laws about when they're supposed to go out of the camp and into the camp for what makes them clean and unclean. And again, it doesn't make as much sense to us, but the, the context is the spies in the land are all watching them. We see this with Balaam. He goes up high to watch them. Normal practice at the time, you send military spies to figure out who are the 600,000 people marching through the land here. They're watching. And so all of the, these ritual laws about when they go in and they go out, they're, they're sending a message to the other nations that are watching them and saying, okay, first of all, it makes no military sense to all have your backs to everybody around you. They're facing into the middle of the camp. What happens if somebody comes from the left, right? Center, like, like, you're not looking. Right, because Yahweh is the one that fights for them and they're focused on him and they're pointing to him and that would have been clear to all the nations that, oh, they're about whatever's going on in the middle there. Also, as people go in and out of the camp, what starts becoming clear is whoever or whatever's in the middle there, like they're gonna ask questions about well, why are they doing this? What are the people going out for? What are they coming back in for? And what, what constantly, if you remember with Leviticus, what constantly is gonna come up in these laws is God is separate from anything that is de dealing with death, with decay, with kind of the life cycle of humanity, that he is both pure and righteous in the moral sense, but also just in the practical sense, he is separate from anything that decays because he simply is the one who is and who rules and who is um, separate. That's what the idea of holiness is. So I linked... Uh, to a neat sermon on Numbers 5, but I'm realizing now you can't click on it on the paper, so uh, again, I'll email those this week. Uh, any questions? I'm going fast. Are we good? Okay. Um, I want to jump down to... What time is it? Okay, let's go... Let's try to... Uh, Let's try to move ahead a tiny bit. I just want to note one more thing in chapter 6. A bit of a climactic moment here. Um, the Lord spoke to Moses in chapter 6, verse 22. Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. This is kind of the goal of the, the tabernacle system when it's rightly running, when all the parts and pieces are going. It's that the Lord's blessing would be upon the people, that they would have peace, and that his face would shine upon them. And, and this, is, this next line is the way you should understand the third commandment. 
So they shall put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Uh, taking the name of the Lord God in vain, the verb is to bear or to carry or to have on you God's name in vain. Then putting the name of Yahweh on the people, the idea is not that you would say a swear word. The idea is that, that you would, the way we would say it nowadays is you would have the name in the community as being a Christian, and then the idea of taking it vainly is like sand, like common, like it's nothing. Like, yeah, I'm a Christian. And then you go live in a way where everyone's like, well, God must not be that great because you're just like us. That's, that's the idea that that's getting at there. Uh, and that's what, yeah, that's what that command is getting at. Uh, so let's move down. You have some notes on chapter 7, 8, 9, uh, I want to go to chapter 11. So this is where they begin to set out. And this is where we start to have problems. And I really want to zoom in on this one chapter because it's the first instance. And if you see the, the parts and pieces at work here, you'll get the rest of the, the accounts of sin and grumbling. Um, so... We often think, or I often think, why is complaining such a big deal? Like, my kids complain all day long, and I don't tell them, like, you shall not inherit my house, get outside, you're done, you know? But, uh, but, but when you start to see, so the, the issue with complaining here, let's maybe just start reading. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. Okay, what misfortunes? He brought you out with all the plagues. He brought you through the sea on dry land. He's been providing food for you. Like what misfortunes exactly are we talking about? And basically, and here's this week, this got very convicting for me. When you sit and think about like what misfortunes? It's hot and we're hungry. I still think that's what we most complain about. Like, like uh, I'm too hot or I'm too cold and I'm hungry. But they're upset. And when the, anger, uh, when, uh, the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Man, that seems like a harsh reaction. Then the people cried out to Moses. By the way, same exact wording from they cried out to the Lord in Exodus. So it's like already got these overtones of, of the slavery in Exodus that was so horrible. That's how they're taking it when they can't get, you know, the right temperature and the right food. They cried out to Moses and Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So the name of the place was called Tabera. Pretty sure that means burning. Um, yes. Um, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now, here's where it's about to get interesting. Get ready. Now the rabble or the riffraff that was among them had a strong craving. That's the word for what Eve had in the garden. They had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, by the way, there's two groups here. There's the rabble riffraff and then the people of Israel. It seems like there's a group within Israel that's leading the rest astray. Just interesting to note, especially as believers, that there are people that can lead even those who do believe astray in some sense or another. They wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Okay. Um, so you've got Genesis 3 everywhere in this passage. This is like a repeat of the fall. The whole incident here is going to center on the word craving and on a desire to eat a certain type of food. Um, I'm not positive on this one, but it's interesting that they want flesh to eat. That's the word, meat, flesh, which is what God gives Adam and Eve after they sin. Um, so not sure on that one, but 
uh, you've got the same root as Eve's craving, and all the way to chapter 11, verse 34, this is going to occur over and over again, this craving word. Also, we have in Genesis 3 that the, the fruit, if you remember, was a delight to the eyes. That's the, the, it gets translated different, but the root word is the same there as what's going on. Chapter 11, verse 6, um, well, before we get to verse 6, the reason God is so angry here is this. Egypt wasn't a good place for them. They were enslaved, but they're rewriting it. Oh, we had all this great food. We had the onions, the leeks, the melons. First of all, it wasn't good for you. You're, you're misremembering. But secondly, God brought them out of Egypt over and over again. It says to bring them to himself, to bring them to himself so that they could worship him, so that they could be with him. And they're missing onions. And you laugh, but like, we, we, we do the same thing oftentimes. Um, I do at least. It, it, the reason God is so upset is because they're trading foolish things that won't ever satisfy them for him. This is Paul's language in, in Romans of trading the, the creator for things that he's created. Yeah, and there's a note there for you. Verse 6 is, is whiny and short. Um, it's really like stilted. Um, our strength is dried up and there's nothing at all, but you know, you can like hear them whining. Then in verse seven, and this is really cool. Um, I kind of, I, I kind of jumped up and down in my house when I saw this. Uh, now the manna was like coriander seed and its appearance like that of bdellium. Okay. Why in the world are you talking about some random metal Moses and describing what the bread looks like? If you go into esv.org or wherever, and you search for bdellium, it occurs one other place in the Bible. Oh, in the Old Testament. Guesses? Utah. Say again? Utah. Uh, good. Does it occur on Utah? I did not get a hit for that when I searched it. I'll double check. I might be wrong. Uh, when I searched it, the only other hit I got was Genesis chapter 2. And if you remember, it's the section where they're describing how God perfectly orchestrated this garden for the man, perfectly provided for him. And even in the metals he gives him, he gives him things from which he can make technological implements to carry out his mission. It's like he's, he's appointed everything perfect for Adam. And it sets you up for when in Genesis 3 and they rebel, you're like, wow. And then Moses sees fit to just, oh yeah, I'm just going to mention that again this time, paired with God's provision, providing again, of the manna. So he's starting to pull out all these overtones to remind you, yeah, this is the same heart attitudes happening again. Then you get down to verse 10. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. They're weeping because they want the meat. And the last time that we saw the phrase, each at the door of his tent, it's when the people were bowing down in worship while Moses and God talked at the tabernacle. At this climactic moment when they're starting to get back the relationship, it uses this phrase, and then now it comes up again, but they're at the door of their tent, not bowing down in worship, but whining for meat. And now we start to see the cracks even in Moses. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. The words are specifically, it was evil in Moses' eyes. Now, I'm going to read Moses' response, and I wanna, I'm going to emphasize uh, a certain word. Moses said to the Lord, why have you dealt ill with your servant? Evilly, literally. Why have you done evil to your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we, that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. What's on Moses' mind? You get it. So you start to see the cracks even in Moses. Let's 
let's keep going because this is, um, it's just good. Even if we don't get as far, it's really good. Then the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand. That verb take their stand is used in military context. So you're supposed to have this ominous like, oh no, they're about to fight against God and that doesn't usually end well. Uh, let them take their stand there with you and I will come down and talk with you there. Also ominous. Uh, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you may not bear it yourself alone. Say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. You shall eat meat for you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat to eat and you shall eat. You shall not eat just one day or two days, five days or 10 days or 20 days, but a whole month until it comes out at your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. Um, again, loathsome there is the, the word nauseated. You're going to look at it and it's going to make you nauseated because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? Look at verse 20. You have rejected the Lord. Again, this is bringing out, they, the, the issue here isn't just that they're whiny. It's that they don't love the Lord. I want to note also for you in uh, chapter, or in verse 23. And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's hand shortened? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. Over and over again in Exodus, what God tells Moses is stretch out your hand, stretch out your hand. And the idea is that God is stretching out his hand to strike the Egyptians. And so God is sarcastically prodding Moses here. Moses is going to remember where that phrase comes from. Is my hand shortened, Moses? You know, that hand that killed every firstborn in Egypt. Do you think I can't provide meat? So they end up naming this place in chapter 11, verse 34, the graves of desire or the graves of craving. And that wraps up that word that we saw from the very beginning, the craving that Eve had. That's the same craving that comes up here. It's the same broken heart or um, sinful heart that needs fixing in the people. Okay. Okay. Let's do this. Let's take a five minute break so our brains can breathe. Uh, and then we'll come back. And I don't know what we'll do about Deuteronomy or the rest of the book. We'll figure it out. <laughs> do, um, I want to do, ba <laughs> I wanna do uh, Balaam and then uh, Balaam and Phineas. And then maybe a touch on um, the, the last couple chapters in Numbers. And then my guess is that'll leave us about 30 seconds to do Deuteronomy. But I'll just give you, if I can, a minute or two of, of kind of thought process that as you read Deuteronomy this week, you can kind of either use the notes if you want or don't, but it'll give you a little bit to, uh, to work through. And then uh, if I'm able to flesh my notes out anymore, then when I send them this week, they can um, go into a little more detail. So in Numbers, let's head forward. So when you see uh, the way chapter 11, the rebellion was described, that's going to come up again. And so if you do read through it, or if you use the notes, you'll see it kind of all stems back to that instance we went through in detail in chapter 11. Um, it does, oh, we, we didn't get to hit this, but remember I said that Kohath, they have like the highest role. They end up trying to basically say, why can't we be priests too? We're all holy to the Lord. You've gone too far, Moses and Aaron. And, and there's this, it, it, okay, so the one last thing I'll say on this section before we move forward, um, I have been struck, I, there were a few things that I was studying this week where the, the way that God has set up authority structures in the world is like, really important in the Old and New Testament. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the world pushes so hard on those, um, that they, they basically hate the way that God has set up both family structures and church structures. And like, like that's not a coincidence. And it carries through from the old to the new. Uh, it comes up everywhere, basically, that 
that in creation, God ordered the world in such a way that it would be blessed through the authority that's given to, to husbands or to different you know, areas of, of society. And, and that, is, that sin is the undermining oftentimes of that authority structure in one way or, or another. Um, uh, that'll probably come up more as we go on, but let's turn forward to chapter 22. So what, what you have, you know, starting in chapter 11 and then all the way up to about chapter 20, you have these stories of rebellion, these stories of hard-heartedness, of unbelief, and you start to see a transition in tra chapter 20 or so of this new generation that God is raising up who is zealous, who loves God. And, and then there's this introduction of this King Balak and this prophet from the east, Balaam. And it's interesting, but, but more importantly, it, it kind of brings into question and clarifies that God is going to both purify this generation and keep his plan on track through unbelief because of the promises he made to Abraham. So I'll show you this, but Balaam's prophecies all point back to the promises made to Abraham, that God, through Abraham's family, would bring someone who could crush the devil and undo the curse. And so super interesting, you have this king of Moab, Balak, who's basically saying, okay, I need to get a spiritual assassin. That's what Balaam is. And so he goes and he, he wants to hire him, but Balaam basically says, yeah, no, I can't do that for you. But when a second envoy comes with more money and more stuff, he's like, yeah, let me go ask Yahweh again and see. And so he ends up, um, let me see if I can get us to the right spot. Um, so God... God tells him, this is chapter 22, verse 12, you shall not go with them, you shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. You should already be hearing, blessed are those who bless you, cursed are those who curse you, way back from Genesis 12. So Balaam arose in the morning and said, you know, go to your own land, he's refused to let me go with you. This is kind of what I was just um, mentioning. And then he ends up going, verse 21, so Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. This next section is supposed to be a little bit humorous in that the donkey sees and understands more of what's going on than Balaam. Now, one thing that is worth noting, Balaam actually engages with Yahweh and presumably is famous in the ancient world because he knew things and could do things that were real. So it, it's you know, take this home and think about it on your own. But God was actually interacting with this pagan prophet. It doesn't mean that we should, you know, give it any more weight than that. But it's there. It's interesting. So he, he the donkey, well, here, uh, God's anger, anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. By the way, this angel of the Lord is appearing because he's fighting for his people and he's keeping this spiritual assassin away, at least for now. Now he was riding on the donkey and his two servants were with him. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road, but this great prophet man, no, he can't see it. The angel of the Lord had a drawn sword in his hand and the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the road stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it's repeated again because he can't see her, but she can. She pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. And then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right or to the left. When she saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. His anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Balaam said, because you made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. This is supposed to be humorous because the angel of the Lord is standing with a sword in his hand. Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? He said, no. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand and he bowed down and fell on his face. Let's move forward to his oracle. So they get him to come. They're going to pay him enough that he'll, he'll, he'll go. 
he goes through in chapter 23, verses kind of one and two, he goes through his uh, prophetic ritual and offers these offerings and goes up to a height to look down. And he went to a bare height, end of verse three, and now coming to verse four, and God met Balaam. And Balaam said to him, I've arranged seven altars, and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. He returned to him, and behold, he and all the princes of Moab were standing beside his burnt offering, and Balaam took up his discourse. Okay, here's prophecy number one. From Aram, Balak has sought me, the king of Moab, from the eastern mountains. Come curse Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him. Remember we said the spies would be looking down on them to watch? This is exactly what Balaam does. From the hills I behold him. Behold a people dwelling alone and not counting itself among the nations. Remember, he gets the message. They're different. They're separate. They're special. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Remember the promise to Abraham. They'll be like the stars in the heavens. And the sand on the seashore, your descendants will be many. Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. Can you imagine? Hey, I hired this spiritual assassin to curse them and he's basically just blessing them. And Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies and behold, you've done nothing but bless them. And he answered and said, must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Okay, so this happens now a second time. He's like, okay, come to another place. Maybe if you look from a different angle, it'll work better. So he goes through the altar or the offerings again. God puts a word in his mouth. He took up his discourse in verse 18 and said, rise Balak and hear, give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? This is talking about God keeping his promises. The big one in mind, the Abrahamic promise, the promise that he'll fulfill his plan for the world to bless the nations through these people. So by the way, Balak, you have no chance. He, uh, behold, I received a command to bless. He has blessed and I can't revoke it. He has, not, he has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. This is noteworthy because they've been sinning all the way up to this point. But this is basically saying, yeah, he's overlooked their weakness. The Lord their God is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt and is for them like the horns of the wild ox. It means he fights for them. For there is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, what has God wrought? Behold a people, as a lioness it rises up, and as a lion it lifts itself. It does not lie down until it has devoured the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. The lion language is from the prophecy to Judah that a ruler will come from Judah, he'll be like a lion's cub. He's drawing on all this previous language to basically say, he can't say anything else, he's saying, yeah, It's all going to come true. God doesn't see their sin. He's promised. He's not going to let it go. And all the promises that these people are going to to be the means of salvation for the world and conquer anyone who opposes them, yeah, that's going to happen. And Balak said to Balaam, don't curse them at all and don't bless them at all. Like, just, just be quiet. Let's go to the third one. Chapter 24. Balaam lifted up his eyes, verse 2, and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely, he's looking at Israel in their tents right now, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river. Does that sound familiar at all? Gardens beside a river? Like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets. His seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher and higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. In the future, Israel will conquer a king named Agag, and they're being described like the Garden of Eden. God brings him out of Egypt and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion, and like a lioness, who will rouse him up? 
Blessed are those who bless you and cursed are those who curse you. Basically, he's like, okay, I'll go into the wilderness this time. Maybe it'll work. And he ends up basically saying the exact same thing because he has to say what God wants him to say. And he keeps seeing them. And all God shows him is these people are essentially standing for the way back to Eden. They are going to receive the blessings of Eden. And oh yeah, no one can fight against them. And then we get the final, the final thing. at least the final one we're going to look at today. He took up his discourse, chapter 24, verse 15, and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of a man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. All right, ready? I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. This is language pointing to the climax of human history. It's, it's far off. There's something coming, but I, I, it's not close. A star shall come out of Jacob. That's language of a ruler. It's also language that ties back to Joseph, who was made a prince and raised up. It's language that a ruler will come out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. A dominant king is coming in the far future from these people. It shall crush the head or the forehead of Moab. Crushing the head should ring bells of Genesis 3.15. And break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also his enemies shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion. This is the word applied to Adam. He's going to be what Adam always was supposed to be, but fail that. And Noah failed that. And Abraham failed that. And all the future ones are going to fail out, but he won't. He shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. So this pagan prophet sees into the far distant future and says, at the climax of history, a dominant king is going to come and undo and crush the head, reverse the curse, and take dominion like Adam was always supposed to. Uh, I can't remember what verse you see this, but basically Balak's response is, yeah, I'm not paying you <laughs> after all this. Um, so last thing that we'll, uh, we'll hit in, in numbers here. Chapter 25, it doesn't give you a clear indication of the exact timeline, but the idea is to basically contrast, just like Moses was on the mountain and the people were making the golden calf at the same time, it's supposed to sound really similar to that. That while God is causing this prophet to, to, to only bless Israel and saying, I'm going to keep my promises even though they are so sinful, this is what's going on kind of in the meantime. We find out later that it was actually Balaam's idea who says, hey, I can't curse them spiritually, but I know how, Balak, you can get at these people. Get them to go against God. And so he actually has Moabite women seduce Israelite men. We find this out that it's mentioned in Revelation, actually a couple other places that tell us uh, more than what we actually see right here in this passage. But we find out that this is a trick and it works. It works so well that chapter 25, verse, we'll start verse 2. The, the, the Moabite women invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord. By the way, that thread actually goes all the way through that the king can suffer for the people, and you know where that heads. Um, the chiefs, the heads, can suffer and be hung in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses. And in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting, they're all repenting, crying over what they've done. And this guy brings, you could say, brings his girlfriend in with them, right in front of them. When Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, before I read on, Aaron's grandson at least knew if didn't see what happened with Nadab and Abihu. This is the anti-Nadab and Abihu story. This is... The generation before that was unbelieving and that, that did not hold God's name as holy is now being reversed. And Aaron's 
sons, firstborn sons died because of what they did, but now his grandson, Phineas, saw it. He rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand. By the way, how in the world did they get in where the Levites? Remember in Numbers earlier, the Levites are given to guard it? Where are you at? He rose and left the congregation, took a spear in his hand, went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus, or in this way, the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Uh, and then down in verse 14, it says, the name of the slain man who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, chief of a father's house belonging to the Simeonites. That is the last death recorded in Numbers. It's as if Phineas drives the stake through and it's like the old generation is done. And he is now the symbol of this new generation who's zealous for the Lord. Then you move right into a census. And in the census, it's only, somebody might have to check this, but I'm pretty sure it's only 2,000 people less. But many, 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 many more than 2,000 have died. The idea is that all of the old generation has died off, but God has completely replaced them. Almost to, you know, within, when you're talking 600,000 people, 2,000 is a very small margin. God has completely replaced them with this new generation. And what are they like? Well, you start to see it. Remember this story that, I'm going to butcher this, the daughters of Zelophehad. Uh, basically, you get this story that's like, what is this about? Why does this matter? These women are coming in and saying, we want to make sure that we get our inheritance in the land, and we're not going to. Now, put this in context. By the way, Moses takes it to God, and God says, yeah, you give them that land. In context, this is showing you this new generation, they're not there yet, but they believe now. They trust, yeah, we are going to go up into the land. Even though the spies bought a bad report and didn't trust the Lord and said, and said, they're great, scary giants in the land. They're like, no, we're going in and we're going to take it. And these women are like, we better, we better get our promise from the Lord in a good way. Like, like we, they, they, they're zealous. And so these last chapters have a few uh, different aspects of giving this new generation kind of the handoff of what they're to do when they get into the land and showing instances of their uh, passion for uh, the passion for the Lord and their passion to, to see his promises come true. Okay. I'm just going to give you a, a five minute uh, overview on Deuteronomy. Everybody ready? Um, Deuteronomy is sermons by Moses as the people are, the new generation is about to enter the promised land. So it's a series of sermons by Moses. They're standing on the edge, ready to go into the promised land, and he's going to take basically the Ten Commandments and expound on them. It's structured around the Ten Commandments. So you have this intro section where... Um, this, this kind of intro section where he's giving them their history and then calling them to be faithful, kind of giving them like, this is the core of the law. By the way, that's where you get the um, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, you shall love the Lord. That's the core of the core of the law. Then chapters 12 through 26, he structures them all around the Ten Commandments. So they're not random. You actually can meditate on the laws in light of the commandment that they're tied to and start to understand, oh, wow. He's saying, you know, um, of course, now I can't think of a good example. Oh, okay. Um, why can't they mix fabrics? You remember this one? You can't have two fabrics. Well, it's under the heading of the law about adultery. So now you have to sit and think for a while, like, how do you connect those two? The point was that even in the way they sew their field, even in the way they wear their clothes, they are about purity. Purity, 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 all the way down. And that says something to the nations around them. So you start to get to put these together in really cool ways. I do have it in the notes so that you can kind of see that. But what Deuteronomy gets at in a word is your heart, your heart. It's that the, 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 the heart of the law is your heart, that you would love the Lord. And, and they're in the sentence, the heart of the law is love for God. It is not a, a rote keeping of the laws. It is that you would really love the Lord. And in fact, I think the one... Um, 
maybe the one spot that we will zero in on is chapter 4, starting in verse 9. Only take care and keep your soul or your heart. There's only one word for, for heart, so sometimes we translate it different ways. But only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children, how on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. And he, he goes on. Um, take care, keep your soul or your heart diligently. The law is about what you love. The, the laws that flow out of this are simply taking who God is revealed in creation, that then comes through into the Ten Commandments, and then those Ten Commandments are explained in the major section of Deuteronomy of how those apply in culture. And we can actually read those today and see the principles being applied, and we can live those out today. Even though I mix fabrics here, and even though we're not under the law, we can still learn wisdom from the law. Torah means or comes from a word that means to point. It points to righteousness. It points to the need for salvation. It points to what is kind of how to live with the grain of God's world. And then there's this phrase that's going to come up all the time throughout the book. So it says, take care to keep your soul diligently lest you forget. We very rarely pair forgetting and love. We think like, oh, well, I just like forgot. I don't know, like you asked me to go to the store and get milk and I forgot, I'm sorry. But Deuteronomy basically ties these together to say loving God is not forgetting what he has said, who he is, what he has done, that forgetting is actually this way of not loving the Lord. Um, and I think, I think we'll end there because that's a great place to maybe just think on. As you read the book this week, keep your eye out for that. Um, I will get you some more uh, notes, but there's lots more notes on Deuteronomy, so you can dig deeper if you'd like. Um, again, email me if you have any questions, and we'll meet not next week, but the week after. So let me pray. Father, thank you for giving us a heart that can love you and know you. Thank you that you opened our eyes when we didn't deserve it. We were running away from you. We weren't trusting you, and there was nothing special about us, but you just in overflowing kindness and love and goodness um, opened our eyes to the truth and brought us into a place where we could hear your word and hear about who you are. And um, so we praise you and we thank you. Lord, please make us people who, um, who live in a way that upholds your glory, your beauty, your love, your kindness. Uh, make us attractive to others, that they would see what you're like, they'd be drawn to you, and they'd be rescued. Uh, we love you, we praise you, and we worship you. Amen.